Hello and welcome to Marquette University's Energy Lab. Today we're going to do the wind tunnel experiment. This is a schematic of a closed loop wind tunnel showing the fan section that blows the air through a diffuser in the settling chamber. It gets large here in this section because we want to slow the air down and allow the turbulence to decay and then we run it through the contractor which speeds the air back up so now we have smooth turbulent free air that we're bringing into the test section and then it's returned through a long diffuser to the fan. So using a closed loop wind tunnel has the advantage of we can use less power to drive the air to higher velocities but it has the disadvantage that we can't use smoke because it would just gum up the wind tunnel. It's two by two meaning that the test section is two foot by two foot in cross section. I've got mounted in the tunnel a NACA 0012 airfoil. This wind tunnel will do about 100 miles an hour so oftentimes when people see the two by two foot wind tunnel they they're disappointed that they can't get inside. I'm not sure why that is, but everyone wants to get inside my wind tunnel. <laughs> this is an example of a large wind tunnel. This is the, actually the world's largest wind tunnel. It's at NASA Ames. I got a chance to visit this wind tunnel. It's an 80 foot by 120 foot wind tunnel. You can see this is the inlet section here. So it's, it's as big as a three story building and it can reach up to 345 miles an hour, which is about uh, Mach 0.3. These pressure taps will measure the static pressure across the top of the airfoil and it's connected then to our scanty valve which will make the measurements for us. The scanty valve is then connected to the computer and from there we can record the data in real time. So before we get started I thought I'd take a second to talk about the airfoil section itself. This is a NACA 4412 so you can see the cross section of the airfoil and the airfoil has embedded in it these uh, pressure taps. These pressure taps run the length of the airfoil down to a hole that exposes the airflow uh, to, to the pressure port. So with this we can measure the pressure. Now a NACA airfoil, the numbers uh, denote the shape of the airfoil. So let me start with the NACA 4412. That's a cambered airfoil meaning the airfoil itself has actually got some camber to it with the cord line like this. The angle the cord line makes with the wind, so if this is the prevailing wind, this is the cord line, this angle here, alpha, is called the angle of attack. Now for a symmetric airfoil like the NACA 0012, which is what's in the wind tunnel now, the top and the bottom shape are the same, so it has no camber at all. There's a straight cord as a result. So this is the top of the airfoil, this is the bottom, and again it has an angle of attack defined like this, alpha. The pressure ports run along the top of the airfoil so that we can measure the top pressure distribution and the bottom. Okay, so we'll start by turning the wind tunnel on here at the control panel and we'll monitor the wind speed with this pitot-static tube connected to this manometer. So as the velocity increases, you can see the inches of water rising across the pitot-static tube. We'll bring it on up here. And we can see then, I can adjust the airfoil to a specific angle of attack. I'd also like to show you some flow visualization. Because this is a closed loop wind tunnel, I can't blow smoke in the wind tunnel because it'll just fill up the wind tunnel with smoke. So instead we're going to use bubbles. This is a helium bubble generator and uh, it's a pretty neat little device here. I can, I can show you how it works. Basically we're going to blow air into this nozzle, we're going to blow soap into the center nozzle, and helium in this third nozzle. We're going to make small helium bubbles here and the air is going to blow the bubbles out and into this container right here. The bubbles that are too heavy will fall and pop. The bubbles that are too light will rise to the top and pop and will pull out just the neutrally buoyant bubbles out of this hose and blow them into the wind tunnel. So now that we have this running, let me show you what they look like. I'll take the probe out of the tunnel and I'll hold it against this black curtain so you can see the bubbles better. I'd also like to talk about dynamic stall and 
What I've done here on this airfoil section is I've placed some tufts, and tufts are nothing but some strings that I've glued onto the airfoil section so you can see the, the flow pattern on the wind. So when the airfoil is fairly level with the wind, the tufts lay flat, and this is really what we want to have happen. When the airfoil pitches up and the angle of attack increases, stall begins to occur, and it's separation from the air, uh, separation of the wind from the airfoil. This separation pattern degrades the lift on the airfoil. So you can see the tufts lifting as I pitch the angle of attack up, and this effect is enhanced as the angle of attack is increased. This is something we want to avoid in practice, and it's something we can measure in the wind tunnel. So here's a nice video that demonstrates separation uh, over an airfoil. This is a NACA 0012, same airfoil that we're using. This was done in a, in a wind tunnel with smoke. So you can see that here's the stagnation streamline. It's right in the front. It hits the body and stops. There is no stagnation streamline coming off in this particular video. Here the airfoil begins to pitch, and you can see that there's this wake that's formed behind the airfoil, this dead zone. This is where the tufts would lift off. So this is an indication that separation has occurred. At this point, the separation line has moved almost to the leading edge. So with the bubbles coming into the wind tunnel, you can see the flow over the top and the bottom of the airfoil section, showing what the displacement thickness is above the airfoil, and also what the gap is behind the airfoil, which is indicative of the drag of the airfoil. Let me pitch this up a bit. Now you can see the recirculation region behind the airfoil where the bubbles are trapped in the wake. Now the best way to do this is if you ensemble average these images, you can create an image with a lot of bubbles in it. So the data from the scan eval is recorded by the computer, and it's recording this in real time. So you can see the numbers for each 16 pressure taps is being uh, displayed and recorded by the computer, and then eventually we'll be able to ensemble average this to get a profile across the top of the airfoil. Once we get that profile, we're going to non-dimensionalize the data using the coefficient of pressure. So the coefficient of pressure, defined as C sub P, is actually, it's the change in pressure divided by the dynamic pressure. The equation for this is pressure, this is the static pressure that we measure, minus the far field pressure divided by the dynamic pressure. So this is static pressure from the airfoil divided by the far field pressure. Subtract the, we subtract the far field pressure. And then this is the air density and the free stream velocity. And we like to non-dimensionalize the data so that data we take in this wind tunnel can be compared with any data from any wind tunnel. And we can also scale this up to real sizes for airplanes and whatnot. So let's uh, go ahead then and uh, reduce the data and plot it up. All right, let's analyze the data. So I've gone ahead and brought the data into Excel so we can have a look at it. This, uh, here's some preliminaries here. This is the inches of water that we measured while we were taking data, about 0.5 inches of water. I've converted that from inches of water to pascals. So this is the uh, dynamic pressure from the, uh, the pitot-static tube. And then converting that from pressure to wind speed is about 14 meters per second. Then these are all of the uh, relevant parameters for the experiment, the kinematic viscosity of air, the cord length of the airfoil, the atmospheric pressure, the sound speed of air, the air density today, the air velocity in the wind tunnel, which is what we calculated above, and then the dynamic pressure. Together, we can calculate the Mach number and the Reynolds number from this. So we can characterize this particular pressure profile. So this is the cord length. So this is uh, all of the data that we took. Um, goes from zero to almost six inches. That's the cord length of the airfoil. Uh, I, I non-dimensionalized the location by dividing by the cord length, so it goes from zero to almost one. This is the static pressure that we measured in the wind tunnel on the airfoil, and I converted it to 
dimensionless pressure using the formula that I showed you earlier for C sub P. I then calculated, knowing, knowing the static pressure, the velocity at each location along the airfoil using Bernoulli equation, and then I non-dimensionalized the velocity by dividing by the free stream velocity. So let's have a look at the graphs. Here's a plot of pressure. So the, the x-axis is showing the cord, the dimensionless cord going from 0 to almost 1. And the y-axis is the pressure coefficient, C sub p. We can see at 0, or at the leading edge, the pressure is almost 1. Theoretically, it should be 1, the stagnation pressure. So that's not bad. Then we see that as, we, as the air rises over the airfoil, it accelerates, it speeds up. So the velocity increases. We know from Bernoulli's equation the, velo the pressure must decrease. So we see the pressure drop sharply as the velocity uh, rises over the airfoil. We get a maximum negative pressure, pressure below atmospheric pressure, very near the leading edge at this Reynolds number and at this angle of attack. And then the pressure slowly recovers as it moves towards the trailing edge. Similarly, the velocity should be just the inverse of the pressure. So what we see in velocity is, we see that at the stagnation location, the velocity is almost zero. The sharp rise in velocity, this is dimensionless velocity, which is important. So this is velocity divided by the free stream velocity. So it exceeds one, meaning it exceeds the free stream velocity almost by 20%. It rises, and then it slowly recovers towards the free stream velocity as we move over the airfoil. So this demonstrates the Bernoulli effect. We've also been able to measure the pressure profile over the airfoil. And if we integrated this, we could get the lift and the drag. I hope you've enjoyed this demonstration. We'll see you again next time. Thanks. Bye.